introduce uh, the latest speaker in our ongoing speaker series. Um, uh, Larry Haas is uh, someone I've had the privilege of knowing for a number of years, and we've uh, realized our lives have intersected even more going back to uh, Yale in the late 1990s, and then uh, uh, a conference we did together in London many years ago, and now um, bringing him out here to, to Austin. He, uh, among his many affiliations, he's a senior fellow with the American Foreign Policy Council, a really important uh, foreign policy think tank in Washington, D.C., that um, Professor Josh Eisenman here at the LVJ School is also affiliated with doing their, doing their China work. And uh, Larry's a man of many talents. Uh, his previous government experience includes working for um, then Vice President Al Gore in the White House and also the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, he's written uh, five books. Um, uh, the most important of which I think is the one he's here to talk about talk about today, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, another previous one I want to highlight is one he published in 2012 called Sound of the Trumpet, the United States and Human Rights Promotion, uh, taking a historical look at America's efforts, uh, uh, episodic efforts to uh, promote human rights and democracy abroad. Um, anyway, he's uh, written for just about every major newspaper and magazine, been on just about every major news show. Um, he's a man you'll be seeing again on TV much in future years, so we're honored to have him here in person. And today he's going to be talking about his newest book, Harry and Arthur, Truman, Vandenberg, and the Partnership that Created the Free World. Uh, and I think this is an especially apt topic uh, during this uh, era of increasingly fraught partisanship and fundamental questions being asked about America's role in the world um, that Larry has, uh, through this book, kind of resuscitated uh, the bygone tradition of bipartisan cooperation uh, in American leadership in the world, epitomized by the Truman and uh, Vandenberg Partnership, which he'll be, he'll be telling us about here shortly, um, after which we'll have ample time for Q&A. So please join me in welcoming Larry Haas. Everybody can hear me in the back, right? Yes? I'm speaking loud enough? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. You know, when you said that you'll be hearing a lot from him in future years, and he's been on everything you'd want to see, and he's written for every everything you'd want to read, I, I'm, I'm reminded of that old line that they use in Washington after an introduction, which is, Thank you for everything you've said that's true, and thank you in particular for everything you've said that isn't. <laughs> and anyway, I, I, I appreciate that very much. Um, Will and I met uh, specifically in 2009 when um, he was serving as senior vice president of the Lugatum uh, Institute, and I was speaking at a conference that uh, the Institute was putting on with the Henry J uh, Jackson Society about the threat raised by the Islamic Republic of Iran, and uh, things have not gotten better since. Is about all I can say for all of our efforts at that conference and elsewhere. Um, thanks, of course, to the Clement Center for National Security for having me. I'm really quite honored to be speaking at such a, an esteemed center of study about national security. Um, I'm a great fan, not just of Will, but of many others who are affiliated uh, with this center, members of your statecraft board, quintessential public servants, some of whom I've worked with, like former Senator Joe Lieberman and former Defense Secretary Bob Gates, and former Under Secretary of State Paula Dobriansky, and members of your academic board, who I learn from all the time, so I'm glad that you're getting an opportunity to learn from them too, Elliot Cohn and John Gaddis, and Robert Kagan and Walter uh, Russell Mead, among others. And um, I'm also proud to share, I must say, with former Governor Clements and with the Center in general, the belief that history can be an important source of insight as we craft policies on foreign policy and national security that we hope will um, keep us safe and serve us well. You know, your website says, Understanding history is essential for wise and effective national security strategy and statecraft. And frankly, I could not possibly agree more, and I think that's particularly true with the history that I'm going to discuss today. I might also say in this election cycle that Governor Clements reminds us of one more thing, which is that in America, our politics do not stand still. Bill Clements became, as you may know, upon his election in 1978, the first Republican governor in Texas in just about 100 years. And since then, Texas 
has been considered one of America's reddest of red states, reliably Republican. And now, if you believe demographics and political trends, we may wake up to a Texas, actually, that's quite different in 10 or 20 years. Uh, and that's because, uh, unlike some other countries, America is not static. America is dynamic. Um, and finally, I do want to thank all of you for coming. I recognize this is a thriving campus uh, with lots of offerings each day, so um, I appreciate that you chose this one over the other possibilities. Um, I'm going to do three things in my talk today. I'm going to tell you why I wrote the book. I'm going to, I hope, tell you just enough to whet your appetite and hopefully entice you to order it through Amazon or some other means. And I'm going to finish uh, with some closing thoughts about how the history I'm discussing really does relate um, to the present and to the future. And then I'm hoping we could have a good discussion about the book or anything even remotely related to it. Ladies and gentlemen, historians often choose what stories to write about because they're inspired by current events. And Will alluded to a bit of this when he introduced me. In that spirit, I wanted to write about the birth of the free world because I thought it was a particularly important story to tell now for a few reasons. For one thing, we Americans in recent years have been rethinking our global role. President Obama has worked to reduce America's footprint around the world, to share burdens with our allies and even our adversaries, and to focus on what he calls nation building here at home. And at the same time, we Americans as a people have become more isolationist, less interested in the world, and more fearful that we can no longer afford our global role. We're in an era in which some members of Congress actually brag that they do not have passports and have never stepped foot outside the United States. And that is quite a change from decades ago. And for another thing, I wanted to address two myths about our current era. First, that our politics have never been more partisan. And second, that we've never faced such a complex set of challenges both at home and abroad. And neither of those mo uh, notions is remotely true, especially when held up against the late 1940s. As I began my research about the birth of the free world, I discovered that no one had told the particular story of Harry Truman and Arthur Vandenberg. And of course, the opportunity to tell an untold story is very appealing to an author. Uh, so Harry and Arthur is, in fact, the untold story of a unique partnership a bipartisanship and a bitterly partisan time, and of two very different men who overcame great obstacles to do great things. And that's what's inspiring and instructive, and I would argue timely, about this story. So, let's dig in. On the morning of April 12, 1945, Harry Truman was Vice President of the United States. Arthur Vandenberg, the top Republican on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And with President Roosevelt's death later that day in Warm Springs, Georgia, Truman and Vandenberg would inherit a world in great turmoil. In Europe, World War II was coming to an end with US and Soviet troops converging on Germany from opposite sides. In London, members of parliament jokingly traded, as it turned out, premature rumors that Hitler was dead. In Paris, the lights had recently returned illuminating the Champs-Élysées and the Notre Dame and other historic sites. But the good feelings could not hide a very bleak reality, which was that the fighting had devastated the continent and its once proud people. Forty million were dead. Millions more were uprooted, including many lost or orphaned children. Europe's <coughs> infrastructure was flattened and its economy was barely functioning. More than half of the housing in its major cities was rubble. Hundreds of ships, thousands of bridges, and tens of thousands of miles of rail were destroyed. Many farms were barren, and as a result, many Europeans were starving. And most Europeans were getting by on just half to two-thirds of their pre-war calories. As one historian later wrote, the four horsemen of the apocalypse 
pestilence, war, famine, and death, so familiar during the Middle Ages, appeared again in the modern world. There would be no return of the old order, with the traditional powers on the continent keeping the peace, because Britain, France, and the other old powers were struggling just to survive. And while the Soviets were still technically one of the Allies, they were quickly turning into a dangerous new adversary of the West. Soviet leader Joseph Stalin was breaking all of the promises he had made to Roosevelt at the Yalta Conference and elsewhere, that he would allow free elections in Poland and across Eastern Europe. And in the weeks leading up to Roosevelt's death, the cables between him and Stalin had grown very icy. So with uh, Europe in such dire condition, the situation was ripe for the Soviets to march across Europe, the Mediterranean, and beyond, or to mount communist insurrections from within Western Europe. So who would step into this global vacuum to maintain order? At the time, America stood tall, uniquely tall. Its mainland was untouched by war. No bombs had flattened its cities, no troops had overrun its farms. And its economy, fueled by the war, had completely recovered from the Great Depression and was overwhelmingly dominating the global economy. But for 150 years, to that point, America had practiced a homegrown isolationism. It was largely guided by George Washington's warning in his farewell address of 1796 to steer clear of permanent alliances. After World War I, America had once again turned inward, rejecting membership in the League of Nations, largely disarming, and erecting huge new trade barriers. And as recently as 1939 and 40 and even 41, America was largely isolationist, which greatly limited Roosevelt's efforts to help Great Britain as it fought desperately to hold on against Nazi Germany. Now, with World War II ending, our leaders face strong public pressure to once again bring the boys home as soon as possible. The wives of soldiers sent letters to Congress, often with baby pictures and even baby shoes stuffed inside. And influential columnists like Drew Pearson were arguing strongly that America's resources were better spent here in the United States. So there was nothing inevitable about America's decision to assume global leadership and to create and lead the free world. It was Truman and Vandenberg who made this happen. So what did they do? Well, from the spring of 1945 to the summer of 1949, in just four and a half years, Truman and Vandenberg worked together to create a revolutionary new American foreign policy. And with it, America assumed global leadership for the first time on a sustained basis to protect our friends, confront our enemies, and promote freedom. Their bipartisan foreign policy had four elements. Under their leadership, the United States first spearheaded the birth of the United Nations to replace the ineffective League of Nations. Second, pledged through the Truman Doctrine to defend freedom from communist threat virtually anywhere in the world. Third, rescued Western Europe's economy through the Marshall Plan. And fourth, committed through the North Atlantic Treaty, which created NATO, to defend Western Europe if the Soviets attacked. With this revolutionary new foreign policy, Truman and Vandenberg transformed America from a reluctant global presence to a self-confident leader. From a nation that traditionally turned inward after war <coughs> to one that stayed engaged to shape the post-war world, and from a nation with no real military establishment to speak of, to one that today spends more on defense than approximately the next dozen nations combined. Charles Bolin, who was a very influential diplomat of the period, later wrote that it was, quote, the transition from total protected isolation as the most secure and non-military country in the world to the greatest responsibility that any single country has ever borne in the history of the world. 
and Truman and Vandenberg overcame great obstacles to do it. Because after all, they worked together in bipartisan fashion at a bitterly partisan time. These were years of, yes, real Soviet spying, but also of reckless demagoguery that laid the groundwork for the McCarthyism that would come a few years later. Congress held hearings on un-American activities. Republicans accused Truman and the Democrats of communist leanings. Truman tried to protect himself politically by creating a loyalty program for federal workers. And civil servants, professors, and others who came under suspicion lost their jobs. Now keep in mind, this was all in the late 1940s, all before Joe McCarthy had delivered his first speech about communists and government. Republicans were angry about Roosevelt's four straight victories and determined to bring democratic rule to an end. In the elections of 1946 and 48, Republicans and Democrats attacked one another in vicious personal language that exceeds what is considered acceptable today. And yes, I do mean even today. <laughs> Republicans questioned not just the judgment of Democrats, but their patriotism. A young House Republican candidate by the name of Richard Nixon won his race in 1946 by calling the Democratic incumbent a communist. And I would argue more to the point, Republican National Committee Chairman Carol Reese called the congressional elections in 1946, quote, a fight basically between communism and republicanism. And Truman compared his 1948 Republican opponent, Thomas Dewey, who was really a middle of the road uh, Republican governor from New York, to Adolf Hitler, and said he was a tool of fascist elements within the Republican Party. Of course, Truman and Vandenberg couldn't remove themselves from the politics of the day, even if they had wanted to. Vandenberg, as expected, won a fourth straight Senate term overwhelmingly in 1946, and Truman uh, shocked uh, apparently everybody but himself by winning re-election in 1948. And of course, when they weren't running for office, each did whatever he could to help his party in election time. But on foreign policy, on foreign policy, this Democratic president and this Republican senator never lost sight of the big picture. They never sidestepped the monumental challenge of Soviet aggression and the awesome new role that only America could assume. They never forgot that to reach their goals, they needed each other. So, who were these men? Well, they were born just 47 days apart in the spring of 1884. Truman in the tiny rural town of Lamar, Missouri, and Vandenberg in the lumbering center of Grand Rapids, Michigan. As products of the great Midwest, they both grew up with a strong sense of Midwestern values, of right and wrong and honesty and integrity that later shaped their views on foreign policy. They both experienced real life at an early age. They both watched their father struggle financially. They both worked during grade school to help pay the family bills. And they both attended college for only one year because they didn't have the money to go any longer. They were both unusually serious and wise as youngsters. Truman spent much of his childhood reading in the local library because his thick glasses prevented him from playing sports. He read mostly history, but also biography. Caesar, Cicero, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Mark Twain. That's as a youngster. Vandenberg, as a youngster, gave lectures on all sorts of subjects that he invited adults to hear. And in high school, he was already reading the congressional record, and he had decided that he wanted to be a senator. Both Truman and Vandenberg inherited their different political parties and philosophies from their families, in particular their fathers. But for all of their similarities in how they grew up, they were very different in personality and style as adults. Truman, for instance, <clears throat> was modest about himself. When he would receive an honor of some sort, he would often write in letters or in his diary, ain't that something? 
something. S-O-M-P-I-N. Ain't that something? Vandenberg, on the other hand, was vain and pompous, and he required constant stroking to keep him happy. When Senator Robert Taft... You said he was a professor? <laughs> Cute. <laughs> when Senator Robert Taft asked his wife Martha to butter up Van, as he was widely known, at a dinner, she later wrote, I tried manfully, but he buttered himself so thoroughly that I couldn't find a single ungreased spot. <laughs> Truman hated the self-important. He called General Douglas MacArthur, with whom he later clashed very publicly, as you know, Mr. Prima Donna Brass Hat Five Star MacArthur, and he said of him, he's worse than the cabins in the lodges. They at least talk to one another before they told God what to do. God tells Mac right off, excuse me, Mac tells God right off. Vandenberg, ironically, also was self-important. Dean Atchison, the former Secretary of State, later wrote this about him. One of Vandenberg's stratagems was to enact publicly his conversion to a proposal, his change of attitude, a kind of politi political transubstantiation. The method was to go through a period of public doubt and skepticism, then find a comparatively minor flaw in the proposal, pounce upon it, and make much of it in due course propose a change. Always the Vandenberg Amendment. Then and only then could it be given to his followers as true doctrine, worthy of all men to be received. He was not engaged in strategy. Rather, he was a prophet, pointing out to more earthbound rulers the errors and spiritual failings of their ways. Truman was insecure as a public speaker, and he favored short, simple, straightforward language. Clark Clifford, the White House counsel, used to, as he put it, Trumanize his speeches beforehand by changing words of many syllables into words of just one or two. When Truman enunciated the Truman Doctrine, he began this way. The gravity of the situation which confronts the world today necessitates my appearance before a joint session of the Congress. The foreign policy and national security of this country are involved. Not exactly poetic. Vandenberg, on the other hand, loved public speaking. He loved flowery language and poetic phrases. He, he wrote his speeches over and over again on his manual typewriter with a cigar dangling from his lips, and they became must-see events in the Senate. For the Marshall Plan, Vandenberg rewrote his Senate speech seven times. It ran 9,000 words, and he needed an hour and 20 minutes to deliver it. And as he wrapped up, he said, there is only one voice left in the world which is competent to hearten the determination of the other nations and other peoples in Western Europe to survive in their own choice of their own way of life. It is our voice. It is in part the Senate's voice. Surely we can all agree, whatever, whatever our shades of opinion, that the hour has struck for this voice to speak as soon as possible. I pray it speaks for weal and not for woe. Vandenberg later said that the Marshall Plan can be, quote, the turning point in history for a hundred years to come. If it fails, we have done our final best. If it succeeds, our children and our children's children will call us blessed. May God grant his benediction upon the ultimate event. When Vandenberg finished, and this was not unusual when he gave a major address, senators jumped to their feet and loudly applauded, and virtually every single one went over to shake his hand. And finally, Truman was mean and crass and vengeful, and he had a long memory for insults and criticism. After the 1948 election, he fired the chief of the Secret Service for visiting Thomas Dewey's headquarters on election night. And he fired the chairman of the National Security Resources Board after his wife suggested that the wives of administration officials wear black to her election night party because, after all, they should dress appropriately for Truman's certain defeat.
Vandenberg, on the other hand, was gracious and forgiving. Although Roosevelt insulted him badly at a White House event in 1939, Vandenberg nevertheless paid an extraordinary tribute to him at the Gridiron Dinner the following year, telling the audience, however much we may quarrel over policy, there is one point at which I can join his loudest psalm singers. Speaking of the man himself, I do not hesitate to say that I never knew a more gallant soul who has laughed triumphantly at the handicaps of life and given his country a superb example of personal courage and a personal challenge to carry on to victory, no matter what the burden, no matter what the odds. His example to us in this regard has never been equaled, and it will, be, and it will never be excelled. So in many ways, Truman and Vandenberg each had qualities that were opposite of the others, and even that the other hated. So how did two such different men work together to such great effect? This Democratic president and this Republican senator succeeded on such a grand scale because first, they shared a vision for what America must do at a very perilous time. They saw that America must shed its isolationism for good, grab global leadership, rebuild Europe's economy, and lead the fight against the Soviets. Second, Vandenberg enjoyed a national stature as his party's undisputed leader on foreign policy that any senator today would envy. And with that st stature, he exerted enormous influence over his Republican colleagues. Those Republicans, in turn, were willing to work with Truman on far foreign policy while they fought him bitterly on domestic policy. And third, and most of all, Truman and Vandenberg would not let their differences in personality and style or the politics around them threaten the job at hand. If Vandenberg needed stroking before he would cooperate, Truman provided it. If Truman became mean and petty, Vandenberg would save the day with his grace. If the two men needed to communicate privately during times when their parties were fighting, they did so. If they were leaders of different political parties, at a bitterly partisan time, they would not let the partisanship around them destroy their partnership. So ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I think that we would be wise to recognize at this moment of political turmoil in America that history has no inevitabilities to it. Our leaders unfortunately, often tell us otherwise. They talk about the unstoppable momentum around the world toward freedom, as one of our recent presidents and former Texas governors did. Or they talk about tides of war that are inevitably receding, as our current president does. But the truth is far more complicated. Freedom does not always reign, and democracies do not always last. So looking back to the late 1940s, we can see how lucky we were. We were lucky in 1944 that President Roosevelt dumped Vice President Henry Wallace, who later became an embarrassing Soviet sympathizer and chose Truman as his running mate that year. We were lucky that in 1928, when Vandenberg was agonizing like Hamlet over whether to run for the Senate that year, the Democratic incumbent unexpectedly died, and the Republican governor appointed Vandenberg to the open seat. We were lucky as well that Truman was advised by such wise men as they are known, all of whom also worked closely with Vandenberg. Secretaries of State, like George Marshall and Dean Atchison, and top State Department officials, like Robert Lovett, Avril Harriman, Will Clayton, Charles Bolin, George Kennan, and others. And we were lucky that Vandenberg had colleagues in Congress to work with. Tom Connolly, the top Democrat on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a Texan, by the way, who went to law school at the University of Texas. Charles Eaton, the top Republican on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And as I've said, Vandenberg's own Senate Republican colleagues who were willing to take his lead on foreign affairs 
while they fought Truman on domestic issues. So we were lucky. If not for Truman and Vandenberg, the world could have become a much different, much worse place. But of course, countries make their own luck, and we seem to find the leaders we need, particularly at moments of crisis, whether it's Washington with the nation's founding, or Lincoln with the Civil War, or Roosevelt with the Great Depression and World War II, or I would argue, Truman and Vandenberg with the Soviet threat. So I'll leave you with the hope that in this very strange, if not sobering, election year, and for many years to come, we continue to make our own luck. And with that, I'll thank you, and I'd be happy to take your questions.